जिंदा खुदा से दिल जो लगाते तो खूब था जिंदा खुदा से दिल जो लगाते तो खूब था मुर्दा बुतों से जान मुर्दा बुतों से जान छुड़ाते तो खूब था Right, let's get started. So, can I request uh, Shawai Sikanda for Talal, please? Assalamualaikum. Welcome, sir. Auzu billahi min shaitan rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wahaza kitabun anzalna humubarakun fattabiyu wattaku lalakum turhamun. English translation. And this is a book which we have sent down. It is full of blessings, so follow it. And guard against sin that you may be shown mercy. Jazakumullah. Okay, Jazakumullah. Ashadu la ilaha illallah wa tuhu la shikru. Ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. Amma abduhu fa unzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, as we're in the blessed month of Ramadan, we're trying to keep on to topics which is somewhat related. And so, of course, during Ramadan, uh, one of the things is the reading of the Holy Quran. So this is the topic for today, the benefits of reading the Holy Quran during the blessed month of Ramadan. So the Holy Quran says, Shahru Ramadan al-Ladhi unzila fihi al-Quran that the month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was sent down as a guidance for mankind with clear proofs and guidance and discrimination. Chapter 2, verse 186. Now, Ramadan has many benefits for us in many different ways. It's not just about not eating, but it helps us also to instill good habits. And one of the blessed habits is the reading of the Holy Quran. Throughout Ramadan, we are reading or listening to its recitation and the dus. And hopefully every morning you are reading the Holy Quran. Perhaps many of you will complete the reading of the whole of the Holy Quran during this blessed month. And this is one blessed habit that you should then continue every day afterwards. And this is the whole purpose of Ramadan, to help us to develop these habits, not just for this month, but then to continue it until the next Ramadan, where again, we start all over again. Again, the Holy Quran relates, Wahada kitabun anzalnahu mubarakun and this is a book which we have sent down. It is full of blessings. So follow it and guard against evils that you may be shown mercy. Chapter 6, verse 156. The Holy Prophet Muhammad has said, keep reading the Quran. For, its, for it will intercede for its readers on the day of judgment. Naturally, the more you read, the more you will understand and benefit from it. By constantly reading it, you will increase your knowledge and your righteousness and your character will become purer. The Holy Prophet Muhammad has said that he who recites the Quran fluently will be the company of the noble and virtuous. And he who recites the Quran haughtily and with difficulty will have a double reward. So naturally, the Quran will 
then everyone benefits from it and you enjoy listening to it. But this piece also informs us about those people that have difficulty reciting the Quran, that because they have difficulty, then because of the efforts, they will have a double reward. Now, whenever we try to do anything, even if we fail or we're poor at it, as long as we keep trying, then we are rewarded for the intention of trying to do it. It is only when you stop trying and say, well, it's too difficult for me, then you lose out on that reward. The Holy Prophet Muhammad has also taught us that we should also teach others about the Quran, its teaching and its recitation. He has said, the best of you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. Whereas he in whose heart there is nothing of the Quran is like a house in ruin. So these, these again shows the importance of not only learning the Holy Quran, but also teaching other people. And that if we don't lose the, uh, recite the Holy Quran and benefit from the Holy Quran, then it's being described here like a house that's ruined. Now, none appreciated its recitation more than the Holy Prophet Muhammad himself. It's related from Ibn Maksud, Razalahu Anhu, that the Holy Prophet Muhammad asked me to recite the Quran to him. I said, Messenger of Allah, shall I recite the Quran to you, whereas it is to you to whom it was revealed? He said, I like to hear it recited by others. And so I recited to him a portion from the fourth chapter until I came to the verse. How would it be when we shall bring a witness from every people and shall bring thee as a witness against these? Chapter 4, verse 42. At this point, the Holy Prophet Muhammad said, that is enough for now. And when I looked up to him, I could see that his eyes were running. It's also good and important to memorize as much of the Quran as possible. There are many people these days who are Hafiz, one who has memorized the whole of the Holy Quran. Now being a Hafiz is a very blessed person. And often like the picture shows here, it's young children that start to learn this and become Hafizes at a very young age. But of course, it takes a lot of time and dedication to not only become a Hafiz, but then to retain it. Now, we may not be all able to learn the whole of the Holy Quran, but at least we should try to learn some chapters and verses. The Holy Prophet Muhammad has said, the case of one who has the Quran by heart is like that of one who has a camel secured by a rope. If he watches it, he retains it, but if he neglects it, it wanders away. So you need to constantly revise your memorization. Otherwise, it is very easy to forget a part or even a word. And the best way to memorize it is to constantly repeat the verses over and over again. Now, the Arabs and many people from the subcontinent have terrific memories and find it easy to memorize. But in this country, we're taught in a different way. In schools, they teach you to question and to seek an answer and not just to memorize the answer. Therefore, people growing up in this country will find it more difficult to memorize but once you tune your mind to memorization, it becomes easier. Now, I remember when I was in Pakistan uh, being taught, I was driving my teachers crazy because I was constantly questioning. And it came natural to me because that's the way we do it in the West. Whereas, of course, in Pakistan and many countries like this, they will just memorize. And uh, sometimes even they don't even turn to the page. They memorize the whole page before they get to it. So this is a beauty, but once you turn your mind into it, you too can be like that. There are some special chapters and verses which will benefit you if you memorize them. This is uh, something which should be familiar from you. It's the oldest holy crown, which is found in Birmingham. Abu Sayyid Rahman relates that the holy prophet Muhammad said to me, Shall I tell you before you go out of the mosque, which is the greatest chapter of the Holy Quran? 
and he then he took my hand. When we were about to issue forth from the mosque, I said to him, Messenger of Allah, you told me that you would tell me which is the greatest chapter of the Holy Quran. He answered, the opening chapter, which contains the seven oft-repeated verses and a, Quran, and a great Quran, which has been bestowed upon me. Here in the picture is calligraphy and beautifully done of the seven verses of Surah Fatiha. Now Surah Fatiha is known as the mother of the Quran, as the seven verses contain the essence of the whole message of the Holy Quran. These seven oft-repeated verses means that it helps fulfill all of our spiritual needs of man. And these seven oft-repeated verses were mentioned as a prophecy in the Holy Bible. So again, this is a, a picture of the uh, Surah Fatiha, and uh, again in calligraphy way. Abu Said Qutwi was the one who relates that the Holy Prophet Muhammad said, concerning recitation of Surah Al-Ikhlas, chapter 112. By him in whose hands is my life it is equal to the recitation of one third of the Quran. So he said that, would any of you find it burdensome to recite one third of the Quran in a course of one night? And of course, the uh, companions, they found this very difficult. They said, well, which one of us has that strength that we can do such a thing, messenger of Allah? And so the Holy Prophet replied that Surah Ikhlas is equal to one third of the Quran. Surah Ikhlas explains beautifully the essence of God and all about his oneness. So again, here's calligraphy of Surah Ikhlas. Anas was who relates that a man said to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sussan, Messenger of Allah, I love Surah class. He told him, love of it will admit you into paradise. The Holy Prophet Sussan has explained what we should do if we become concerned or we're frightened. Abu Sayyid Khudwi was the one who relates that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sussan used to seek protection against a jinn and the evil eye till Surahs al-Falak and al-Nas were revealed. After they were revealed, he took to them and discarded everything besides them. The Holy Prophet Muhammad has also informed us that if a person recites the last two verses of Surah al-Baqarah at night, they will suffice for him. Again, the Holy Prophet Muhammad has admonished do not convert your houses into graves. Indeed, shaitan runs away from a house in which Surah al-Baqarah is recited. The Holy Prophet Muhammad has said concerning Ayatul Qutsi, chapter 2, verse 256, that this is the grandest of all. He has also said that if you recite it when you go to bed, it will be a guardian over you on behalf of Allah, and shaitan will not be able to approach you until morning. So again, this is a click fear of Ayatul Qutsi, and it's a good practice to recite Ayatul Qutsi, Surah Falak, and uh, Surah and Nas, and Surah Klas, uh, before you go to bed. The Holy Prophet Muhammad has also informed us that he who commits to memory the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kaf chapter 18, will be secure against the Antichrist. In one question, it's the last 10, stores, last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kaf. Now, generally, if we read these first 10 and 10, last 10, they're all about Christianity. And of course, we believe that the uh, Dajjal is the Christian missionaries. Finally, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has told us, whenever people gather together in one of the houses of Allah, for the recitation of the Quran and teaching it to one another, comfort descends upon them. Mercy covers them, and angels spread their wings over them, and Allah makes mention of them to those around him. Now, in a, I think a couple of Jumas ago, Azur launched the new search engine for the Holy Quran. And he launched a new website for searching the Holy Quran, and that is holyquran.io. 
So here's a picture of Zul uh, going to that website. Now this search engine has been created by the alislam.org team, but can be accessed by a separate website. Any chapter, verse, topic, or word can be searched in either Arabic, Urdu, or English in this new search engine. These search results can be compared with translations done by the community, along with translations done by non-Amadis. The commentary, topics, and related verses can be seen with every verse. There's still more work that needs to be done on this, as this is only the first version of this search engine, and the updated version will be completed by the annual convention in the UK 2021, inshallah. Furthermore, on the alislam.org website itself, a new layout for reading and listening to the Holy Quran has been added. Verses can be read with English commentary, word by word translation, and an index of it. Our beloved Hazor, may Allah always be his helper, prayed that this project becomes a means of spreading the beautiful teachings of the Holy Quran throughout the world, and that members of the community may also be able to benefit from this. Now, there's a bit more, but I thought I'd stop here and give a chance for anyone that wants to ask any questions, make any comments, uh, either on today's topic or anything really to do with Ramadan. If not, we'll continue with uh, a bit more. Uh, any questions, any comments, anybody? There's no comments on the chat at the moment. Um, if anyone would like to drop any comments on the chat, you can, you're more welcome to, or you can also, um, you know, open your mic and it is a discussion. So please do, um, you know, we've got a hand up from Samir Ahmed Sam, Yasin. Okay, yes, Samir. Assalamu alaikum wa uh, I just wanted to share about uh, one of the hadith that you mentioned that uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas constitutes uh, one third of the uh, Holy Quran. Um, I was listening to one of the uh, dars by Hazrat Khalifat al-Masih Rabe, and uh, uh, he mentioned that uh, it does not mean that uh, reciting uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas for three times. Um, is, uh, is equal to one Quran. It's actually Hazrat Khalifa al Awwal who has, uh, he referred to Hazrat Khalifa al Awwal's, and that was very good point that Hazrat Khalifa al Awwal had made. That um, um, actually, Quran Kareem, Hazrat Khalifa al Awwal divided Quran Kareem in three uh, different, uh, uh, different. Uh, um, subjects and one of that is uh, the Tawheed of Allah Ta'ala, the praise of Allah Ta'ala. So he says that uh, one third of Quran is uh, um, comprises of uh, the Tawheed of Allah Ta'ala and uh, this since Surah Ikhlas refers to that, so that is why we can say that it is equal to one third of that. So it is also uh, one of the points in there. Yes, exactly for that. Um, of course, any portion of the Quran, it's not just reciting it, it's acting upon it as well. And this, as you said about Tawheed, it's a very beautiful ayat, uh, as there are many others, but it beautifully explains about the Tawheed of um, Allah. And uh, not that we're trying to find a shortcut, <laughs> that, uh, as you said, you like it three times. First time I've heard that one, actually. Um, no, obviously we should keep continuously reciting the Holy Quran and these are not shortcuts as such, they're just showing the blessings and that's what he's trying to get across, the great blessings of uh, this Quran. Okay, Hakim, you want to say something? Your mic is on. No. Okay. Right, anybody else got anything they want to say or should we move on? You can always come back, it's not a problem. Okay, I'm going to take that as we're moving on. Right, so the next bit that I want to look at, uh, I was a bit hesitant because obviously it's one done, but I thought, okay, well, it's a tablet class, so we should cover something there, not just to be it. So this is on, has verses of the Holy Quran 
been abrogated. So the Holy Quran states, Whatever sign we attribute, uh, sorry, whatever sign we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than that or the light thereof. Does thou not know that Allah has a power to do all that he wills? Chapter 2, verse 107. So here some uh, Muslims and some other people, they say that this is related to the Holy Quran and that verses of the Holy Quran has been abrogated or made to be forgotten. Right, well, I just said that. So the thing is that if this is true, this is what the Muslim commentators are saying, that some of the verses of the Holy Quran has been abrogated by other verses, then what does it mean? And this is what we should think about. Which verses are correct and which have been abrogated? So the thing is that we can't then say that this, the Holy Quran, is a perfect book when obviously if this is the case, that some verses have been abrogated, have been rejected, then it's not perfect at all. Abrogating means that uh, that verse is no longer needed, it's, it's useless. So it means that Allah has now thought of all these verses and sent these verses, but then thought, okay, that one's no good now. I'm going to bring a different verse. And so how many verses and what then is true, what isn't true? So we might as well, if this is the case, we reject the whole of the Holy Quran because it's not perfect after all. It's been changed. So, of course, the Jumar Ahmadiyya, we understand that this is not the case. Actually, these verses are not talking about the Holy Quran at all. It's talking about the previous scriptures. It is pointed out in these verses, in this verse, that the previous scriptures contain two kinds of commandments. Firstly, those which, owing to the changed conditions of the world, needed to be removed and updated as a universal teaching instead. So we say that the Bible was only for that particular time, that particular people, but we needed a universal teaching for all time. So obviously the Bible is not meant to be for all mankind, whereas the Holy Quran is. Secondly, those which contain internal truths, which didn't require abrogation, but reminding people of the forgotten truth. So there are some uh, teachings uh, in the previous scriptures which haven't been emphasized, which need to be re-emphasized. And especially like we see today that the teaching, for instance, of jihad, that we're saying now the teaching of forgiveness, that needs to be emphasized in this day and age. But the same teaching was there in previous times. It wasn't all about fighting. There is that teaching found in previous teachings as well. So the Holy Quran has emphasized this as well. Therefore, it was necessary one, to abrogate certain portions and bring in their place newer, better ones. And B, to restore those lost ones. Therefore, Allah abrogated some portions of the old books, replacing them with new and better ones and reintroducing the missing portions by similar ones. Allah has protected the Holy Quran and ensured its purity and integrity. The Holy Quran, chapter 15, verse 10, uh, relates that verily we ourselves, God is, has sent down this exaltation, and most certainly we, God, will be its guardian. If the abrogation of any part of the Quran be conceded, the promise about its protection becomes null and void, for it would be impossible to distinguish the abrogated portions from the rest of the book. Those who had up, upheld, upheld the abrogation theory have gradually been compelled to reduce the number of abrogated verses from as many as 500 verses. Later scholars have gradually reduced this to only five. But even that is incorrect, for there is absolutely no verse in the Quran which has been abrogated. 
For instance, Hazrat Shah Waliullah was a mudathif from Delhi in 1176 Hijra in his tafsir al fazyu Kabir stated that commentaries, commentators have taken the number of abrogated verses in the Quran even up to 500 or perhaps more. Imam Suyuti had reduced this number to 20 but then stating in the end that in his estimation there was only five verses in the Quran that were mansukh. Mansukh means abrogated. Ibn, uh, Ibn Arabi has stated that everything in the Holy Quran about forgiving, turning away from and avoiding kufa has been abrogated with the sword verse. But when the forbidden months are passed, then fight and slay the pagans. Chapter 9, verse 5. So, obviously, we know in the early history of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he did not fight. And whilst he was in Mecca, he did not fight. So what they're saying is that when he moved to Medina, and this verse was revealed, that you can now fight, then all those verses about forgiveness uh, and things like this, they had now been abrogated. And instead, you should go around killing everyone. Hence, we see the terrorism of today. Oops, what was that? So, yeah, so they say that this verse, this uh, verse about killing, has abrogated 124 verses of the Holy Quran. The promised Messiah, Hazrat Meza Glam Ahmed al-Islam, emphasized how the Holy Quran was a perfect book and that the theory of abrogation would in fact, invalidate the entire Quran. He has said, and we have complete confidence in the fact that the Holy Quran is the last divine book, and there is not one iota or dot that can be added or detracted from its laws, limits, commandments, and orders. Now, there is no revelation or inspiration from Allah that can modify, change, or abrogate any command of the Holy Quran. Again, he said that the truth is that the text of the Holy Quran cannot be truly abrogated or added to because this would then falsify the whole of the Holy Quran. Now, an example of the verses which they claim to have been abrogated are that first, the Muslims were told by God that the intoxicating drinks, alcohol, contain more harm than good. Chapter 2, verse 220. But that was then abrogated with this verse that then they were commanded not to say their prayers if they were intoxicated. So now this has abrogated that previous verse, chapter 4, verse 40. But both these verses was then abrogated when this verse was revealed that finally came the commandment to shun this uncleanliness altogether, chapter 5, verse 90. The promise of silence Islam made it clear that this misunderstanding by stating that all these verses are still made it clear. Oh, sorry, let's say this again. The Prophet Sallallahu cleared this misunderstanding by stating that all these verses are still very much relevant today and none have been abrogated. He said that there are still some good in alcohol. I mean, we can use it for medicine, etc., especially homeopathic medicine, things like this. And we should always perform our prayers in our full senses and not be overpowered by sleep, etc. So it's not just relating to alcohol. Anything, even tiredness, you should be in your full sense and not approach your prayers whilst you are not concentrating properly. And, of course, the final one, alcohol, has been proved to be bad. And even nowadays, even in the West here, now they're saying that just have more than one drink. One drink and you can't drive, drink and drive. So this now, they've also admitted of the dangers of drinking alcohol. Okay, so now again, we're opening up uh, any questions on that or the previous ones or any questions on fasting uh, or anything else really. If, has anybody got anything they want to say? Um, Rabbi, we've got some uh, questions on the chat, if you allow me to read them out. Yeah, please. Okay, so, um, so I'm just going to compile some of the questions. So the first one is, I'm going to add this onto another one as well. So it's, what is the actual meaning of the word Quran? And is it, uh, um, and is it a root meaning? And it's, sorry, and it's root meaning? 
And uh, the question I'll just add on to that is, um, was the Holy Quran compiled in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Okay, I'm assuming this may be a child who's asked this question, but uh, anyway, whoever, it's a good question to ask and it's good to know. So the Holy Quran itself, it means to read or recite. And uh, obviously it is the most read book in the world, uh, I believe, because all Muslims read it every day, or they should be reading it every day. Um, the Holy Quran was revealed in piecemeal. What that means is that it came at different times, uh, over 22 years. So there was a purpose for that as well, because as it was coming, so the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he would memorize it and he would tell other people and they would memorize it. So obviously to memorize it uh, in little bits of bats is much easier than trying to memorize the whole of the Holy Quran. Plus also when there were issues that needed to be resolved, so the Holy Quran would then speak about those issues. So over 22 years, the verses came down. Now, it's not in the order that was revealed. For instance, the very first Quran, uh, verse of the Quran was um, chapter 96, uh, Ikra, uh, that read uh, and so forth. And the very last um, chapter of the Holy Quran was... Um, um, so Maida, chapter 5 verse 4 where it says that we now completed the favor upon you so this shows that it's not in the order of when it was revealed what happened was the angel Jibril would come and revise with the holy prophet every year and whenever any verses was revealed he was told before this verse and after this verse and he would tell the, the companions so they knew the order was building up when the holy prophet sadly passed away that was the end of the Quranic revelation. And so now the Holy Quran was complete. So um, there was no more Quranic verses after the Holy Prophet. But of course, at that time, it was still only in memorization. It was put in book form in the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr. So I hope that's answered that question for you. Any more? Um, yeah, there's, an, there's another question. It's not r really relating to um, the topic that much, but I'll just still ask it. So it says, what, um, what is the correct process if you wake up late for Suhoor? All right. I mean, obviously, uh, if you've woken up late, then you can't eat uh, your breakfast. So you missed your food. This is why uh, it's good to have some food. And the Holy Prophet said, don't go 24 hours without food. So if you've had food at iftar time or a bit later on, at least you've had some food. But ideally, it's good to get up at uh, the Sahur time to have some food. So if you got up late, then you should begin the fast without food. Uh, you shouldn't miss the food. No, you shouldn't miss the, sorry, you shouldn't miss the fast. But you can't eat, because uh, if you eat, then you've broken the fast. Um, that's all the questions we've got so far. Um, if anyone would like to, you know, unmute yourself and have any questions or comments or anything, please do so. So there's some interesting questions there, and I hope that's given some idea for other people to ask similar questions. I'm sure you do face some during Ramadan. I think everyone's too hungry. They, they're waiting for the faster break. No more questions? No, no, not at the moment. Not, nothing which has come through. I mean, it's such a, it's such a wide topic that, you know, we all can relate to it in, in, in some form of way. Well, this is why I, thought this, I wanted to give some more time for question answers because uh, I thought more questions would come during Ramadan. And so that's why I kept the talk a bit shorter than normal. But I was wrong. <laughs> so, I mean, it's the last chance, otherwise, we'll finish. And you can look forward to having some food soon. Okay. Right. Then, if there's no more questions, then let's finish it there. And please join me in silent prayer. Okay, Bismillah.
Okay, as-salamu alaykum. Like